Hey boys and girls, Miss Block here. Loser by Jerry Spinelli. We are on chapter six. A wonderful question. Donald Zinkoff, before arriving in first grade, he has learned his letters, some of them anyway, and of course he has seen his name from time to time, but he has never traced it on see-through paper. He has never tried to copy it, has never hitched a ride on a pencil point, feeling the shape and movement of his name's letters. Now, as he moves the pencil across the blue lines of the paper, he feels a thrill. He stares at his name, and it is as if he is staring at himself, as if the Donald Zinkoff that was born six years ago is here and now, by his own hand, in some small way, being born all over again. He rushes up to the teacher. He shoves the paper in her face. Look, it's me! She takes the paper. At the top is his name as she has spelled it out for him to copy, as she has done for all of the students. Below that is his own attempt. If she didn't know what it was supposed to say, she could never read it. The confusion of pencil lines on the paper makes no more sense than the playpen doodlings of a two-year-old. The joy streaming up from his face makes her smile. She lays a hand on his shoulder. To be perfectly precise about it, she says, it is not you. It is your name. Your name is very important. It represents you. What does represents mean, he says. That means it takes your place. It sort of substitutes for you. Even when you yourself are not in a particular place, your name can be there. And so it's important to write it properly. She hands the paper back to him. And to write it properly, you must practice. Use both sides. A hundred slides, sides would not have made a difference. Collecting papers before recess, she discovers that she still cannot read Donald Zinkoff's name. Of itself, this is no big deal. He certainly isn't the first sloppy handwriter she has come across. In the past, she has had straight A students who could not seem to write a legible word. On the other hand, sometimes poor penmanship indicates a problem with motor skills. For the boy's sake, she hopes he is simply sloppy. Recess! At exactly 10 a.m., Zinkoff bursts onto the playground with the other Statterfield first, second, and third graders. For the first minute, he is disappointed. He expected recess to be something different, something new. It turns out to be simply free time. Recess turns out to be just another name for life as he always known as he's always known it, only shorter. His first recess lasted six years. This one is 15 minutes. He means to make the most of it. He dashes back into school. No one stops him. No one sees him. No one has ever run back into school during recess. He pulls his giraffe hat from the cubby and runs back out to the playground. Hey, there he is, someone shouts. The kid with the hat. In seconds, there's a crowd around him, kids reaching up to touch the hats, kids calling, can I wear it? And then the hat is gone, snatched from his head. A boy has it. He's running off with it, jamming it onto his own head. Now other hands are reaching, grabbing, snatching. The hat goes from head to head. The kids are screaming, laughing. A second grader runs off with it. He goes galloping around the playground. The brown and yellow hat bobs on his head like a real giraffe. Zinkoff laughs out loud. He enjoys the spectacle so much that he forgets that the hat is his. And then a tall red-haired boy, a fourth grader, stands in front of the galloper holding out his hand. The second grader takes off the hat and hands it over. The red-haired fourth grader looks at the hat carefully. Instead of putting it on his head, he sticks his arm into it all the way to his shoulder. With his fingers inside the hat, he makes the giraffe nod and seem to talk. He walks over to one of his equally tall friends. He makes the giraffe's mouth open onto his friend's nose. Everybody laughs. Zinkoff laughs. Even the recess duty teacher laughs. The boy turns to the first graders who are keeping their distance. Whose hat is this? Zinkoff runs forward. He trips over a foot and falls flat on his face. Everybody laughs. Zinkoff laughs. He comes up to the tall red-haired boy. He stands much closer than a first grader normally gets to a fourth grader. He looks directly up into the tall boy's face and proudly announces, It's my hat. The boy smiles. He shakes his head slowly. It's my hat. Zinkoff just stares at him. He is fascinated by the boy's face. He has never seen a face smile and shake itself no at the same time. And he realizes that apparently there has been a mistake. Perhaps the tall boy was at the zoo on the same day Zinkoff was there. Perhaps he bought the giraffe hat first and left it behind by mistake. Whatever, there is no mistaking what the boy said. It's my hat. Zinkoff is sad. He has really come to love the hat that he thought was his, but he is not sad too because he can tell how happy it makes the tall boy to get his hat back. 
The boy is still smiling down at him. Zinkoff already knows that smiles do not like to be alone, so he sends his best smile up to join the, the one above. Okay, he says cheerfully. The smile on the tall boy's face twists and changes. Zinkoff does not know it, but he has just cheated the boy. The boy expected Zinkoff to, be, to make a fuss, to try to get his hat back, maybe even to cry or pitch a fit. The boy loves to see first graders pitch fits. It's fun. And now he is cheated of his fun, cheated by the smiling, agreeable little insect in front of him. The tall boy takes off the hat. He pokes zinc off in the forehead with one of the giraffe's horns. It's not mine, you dummy. He wags his head and snickers. He turns to his friends. First graders are so dumb. His friends laugh. He throws the hat to the ground and he walks off. He makes sure to step on it. Zinkoff picks up the hat. Pieces of grit cling to the fuzzy surface. Suddenly, the tall boy turns and looks back. Zinkoff drops the hat in case the boy wishes to step on it again, but the boy only laughs and goes away. Zinkoff's mother is waiting for him after school. All the way home, he jabbers about his incredible first day. Do you like your teacher? She asks him. I love my teacher, he says. She called us young citizens. She pats the top of his hat, which makes him almost as tall as her. One thousand congratulations to you, he beams. Do I get a star? I believe you do. His mother always carries with her a plastic baggie of silver stars. She takes one out, licks it, and presses it onto his shirt. There. As he bows his head to look at the star, the hat topples from his head. His mother picks it up. She puts it on her own head. Zinkoff howls and claps. She wears it the rest of the way home. Later, Zinkoff sits on the front step waiting for his father to come home from work. His father is a mailman. He walks all day on his job but drives to and from the post office in his clunker. The Zinkoffs cannot afford a new car, so Mr. Zinkoff buys used ones. Every time he buys one, he gets excited. She's a real honey bug, he says. And then, a month or two later, every time the honey bug starts to go bad, a retread tire loses its rubber, the carburetor starts coughing, the belts break, he keeps patching it up with duct tape, balling wire and chewing gum. Pretty soon everything is patches except Mr. Z's faith in his honey bug. The day always comes when Mr. Z, Mrs. Z whispers to her son, It's another clunker. Zinkoff giggles and nods, but he never says the word clunker to his father, as that might hurt his feelings. It is never long after Mrs. Z says clunker that the car dies, usually on a rainy morning on the way to work. The car simply refuses to move another inch over the face of this earth. And even Mr. Z knows that it is beyond the help of even a thousand new plugs of chewing gum. The next day, he gets rid of it and begins shopping for a new honey bug. The cycle happened four times so far, which is why Zinkoff's mother and son, between the two of them, call the current car Clunker 4. Zinkoff hears Clunker 4 long before he sees it and makes a high squeal that reminds him of elephants in the movies. He runs to the curb as the car rounds the corner and rattles to a stop. As usual, there is a smell of something burning in the air. Daddy, he cries out, jumping into his father's arms. I went to school. And a star to prove it, says his father, hoisting him into the house. Zinkoff talks about his first day at the dinner table, and after dinner and right up until bedtime. As always, the last thing his mother says to him at night is, say your prayers, while she hides his giraffe hat in the trunk with the comforters and fancy tablecloth. Zinkoff transfers the star from his school shirt to his pajamas. He climbs into bed and tells God all about his first day. Then he tells the stars. At this time in his life, Zinkoff sees no difference between the stars in the sky and the stars in his mother's plastic baggie. He believes that stars fall from the sky sometimes and that his mother goes around collecting them like acorns. He believes she has to use heavy gloves and dark sunglasses because the fallen stars are so hot and shiny, she puts them in the freezer for 45 minutes. And when they come out, they are flat and silver and sticky on the back and ready for his shirts. This makes him feel close to the unfallen stars left in the sky. He thinks of them as he as his night lights. As he grows drowsy in bed, he wonders which is greater, the number of stars in the sky or the number of school days left in his life. It's a wonderful question. Hi, boys and girls.